Unfortunately, we hear more about hostility than we do about love. Recently I read, we have a great vocabulary for hostility, but we need new ways to say, I love you. Receiving affection throws people into more of a crisis than being yelled at. People need both. It's the sound of two hands clapping. For centuries, prose, poetry, and songs have been written about love. Tonight at the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire, as part of our celebration of the humanities, we are proud to have Dr. Leo Bascalia speaking on love. His topic will be, what is essential is invisible to the eye. Dear friends, please welcome our guest. It's really a, an honor for me to be introduced by such a lovely lady. And I do hope that this lovely lady can hear me because we were afraid that it would be a dead spot in the back here. Can you hear me? If you can't, just pull on my trousers, okay? <laughs> Uh, I always love to start uh, and tell you stories about my name. Some of you have heard the mod nauseum, but I've got new ones. But I'd, I'd, uh, I, I'd like to start by telling some of you who haven't that I do have a very difficult name, as you've seen in the program, to pronounce. It's uh, one of those beautiful Italian names. It has all the letters of the alphabet. It's spelled B-U-S-C-A-G, which throws everybody, L-I-A. And I, I love the story of making a long-distance telephone call, and the line was busy, and the operator said she'd call me right back as soon as it was free. And when the phone rang, I picked it up, and I, she said, would you please tell Dr. Boxcar that his telephone call is there? I said, could that be Bisc she said, sir, it could be damn near anything. <laughs> and you know, not only, the, uh, some of you have heard my tapes and so on, and you know that my name is not only difficult in terms of Buscaglia, but my real name, my first name is Felice, which is really a masterpiece. It's spelled F-E-L-I-C-E. -E, and if you know from your Latin, mama was a very wise lady. Uh, it means happiness and joy and peace. She started it from the very beginning, you know. And, and my middle name is where Leo comes from, and it's Leonardo. So if you see it all together, it says Felice Leonardo Buscaglia. And I say that's a real whopper. Um, oh, thank you. There you are alert. <laughs> um, but I was, I was asked to give some papers in the communist bloc countries, and in order to do this, I had to get clearance. And in order to do this, you have to fill out all kinds of little forms. Some of you have had this experience to get the visas. And then you give them to a little man behind a cage. And then you sit down and wait. And you talk to people and you have a good time. And then your name is announced over a microphone and you go up and take the oath of allegiance to your country. And that's all well and good. And the man behind the little cage was having no trouble at all because he was talking about Jim Brown and Sam Jones and so on and so forth. But I knew he was going to call me because when he got to this paper, he sort of looked strangely around took a deep breath and said, Phyllis? <laughs> and I swear I'll answer to anything but Phyllis. And last year, and this is the new one that no one's ever heard, because it just happened, I was asked to teach in the uh, uh, graduate study centers in Asia, and this is always a great pleasure for me. And I was teaching in Bangkok, in Thailand, and I needed to get my passport renewed. And I, w I had to cross into Cambodia in order to get their stamp. You know, uh, I think borders are pretty silly. Uh, and this shows you how very ludicrous the whole process was. But you go across and they stamp your passport having exited, and then you cross again through a little cage, you know, and they pass it, enter again, and you're legal, which is crazy. But anyway, um, I, in order to do this, I had to give him my passport, and I gave him the passport, but he flipped to the wrong page. And I tried to tell him, but I don't speak uh, any Cambodian language, and I tried to tell him, you, you were on the wrong page, but he listed me in this very official book, and forever I'll be listed in posterity as Mr. Scar Above Right Eye. <laughs> They happen to me all the time, you know. Uh, before I talk to you tonight about the subject that I'd like to discuss with you, and, and you know, um, uh, I devoutly hope that someday uh, 
some of us will have the opportunity of being a bit more intimate than here. But I have a, a real thing about small groups, and every time I go somewhere, I, I have something like this to contend with. But I will try really hard to reach you people who are sitting way back in the back. And uh, the way you can reach me is to s wiggle a little and send up a vibration every now and then, you know. Uh, then I'll know that I'm with you and you're with me because that's what I really want to have happen. But there's something that I don't want to have happen tonight, and I'd like to explain what that is, and then we can start right in. And um, there are many ways of learning. And one way I learned when I was in a Zen monastery in Asia for a year, uh, I had a marvelous little teacher who was just about so tiny, a little Japanese man. And he was so gentle and so wondrous and so full of beautiful things to share. And his entire life was a sharing, uh, as I would like my entire life to be, and I hope as you would like your entire life to be. And that's why I'm very much concerned that I become more and more so that every time I'm with you, I have more and more to share. But I remember on this particular day, we were walking in a beautiful garden of giant bamboo. And some of you who have been in Japan know how beautiful that can be. And we were wandering through this garden and uh, I was really carrying on for some reason. I, I was running off at the mouth about all of the wondrous things that I knew, all of the great wisdom that I had. And I was really impressing this man, you know, just trying to tell him, this is what I know. When all of a sudden, this very nonviolent little creature turned around and slapped me right on the mouth. Talk about a good learning technique. <laughs> you know, and I looked at him holding my bloody lip, and I, I said, why did you do that? And with all the vehemence, more vehemence than I have ever seen in this man before, he said to me, don't walk in my head with your dirty feet. And I promise you that before I came tonight, I washed my feet clean. <laughs> I have no intention of walking in anybody's head. All that I want to have happen between us tonight is a very gentle sharing. Uh, you take from what I share what is right for you, and what isn't, you let go. Uh, I have no ax to grind. I have nothing to sell. But I have a lot to share, and I'm excited about sharing. And what I'm hoping and what I hope is that we can share together. And maybe we'll have that opportunity in some way or another before we pass our ways. But uh, I, I guess most of you know by tapes or books that you might have read of mine that I'm very heavily into the study of love as a learned phenomenon. And I truly believe that all of us have this incredible potential to love. But it is only a potential and like all potentials, unless it's realized, unless you do something about it, it's not going to happen. And I was one of the weird ones about six years ago who started a class that I called love, a love class. And uh, many of you know that several years ago there were only 15 or 20 in the class. And now I think if we allowed 400 or 500, there would be so. But I tried to limit it to about 50 so that we can really get together. And I don't teach that class. I facilitate it. I make it possible to happen. I sit down with people and I learn from them. Because since love is learned, each of you has learned it differently. And you have as much to teach me as I have to teach you. And that's why, really, at, at heart, love is a sharing. But um, maybe you don't know how I got started with this. And I'd like to talk to you a little bit about that. Um, I have a thing about eyeballs. Some of you have already seen this. Uh, uh, I, I look around and, and I see eyeballs. I hunt for them. And when I find nice, gentle eyeballs that let me in, I, I feel I'm safe, you know, and so then I can, I can really get with it. And I do this in classes. I look around as soon as my classes get together, and sometimes I have as many as four and 500 in a class. And I look around and I find these eyeballs. And then if, you know, if I forget where I am or I lose my place, I look at those eyes and they say, come on, Biscaglia, you're doing all right. You know, and I can keep going. And in this particular class, I found these eyeballs about five rows or six rows back in the head of a very beautiful, very lovely and gentle young lady. And uh, 
I, I, I was very impressed with her because not only did I find she had these marvelous inviting eye, eyes, you know, but also she responded so well to what I had to say. And as teachers, we're always very ego involved in our students, let's face it. So she'd poke her neighbors and say, did you get that? Or she'd say, groovy, and she'd write it down, you know, and I'd say, oh, I'm communicating with someone. And after uh, about six weeks into the semester, and by the way, she handed in unbelievable little papers. And I say little papers because I never demand big tomes. I ask people to spend all of their time thinking and then put, a, put it, what they had thought about concisely into one paragraph. If you can't say it in five sentences, it's not worth saying. You know, that kind of thing. And that's really a blast to try to do it. Um, but anyway, she used to be able to get it in a beautiful, concise paragraph. And somehow or other, we had taught her to read and to write and to spell and to punctuate and all the things that we consider to be so vitally important. And I was very impressed. And then one day, about six weeks later, her chair was empty and it remained so for several sessions. And I, because I am ego involved with my students and I'm not ashamed of it, I think we can only learn from and teach people with whom we care and with whom we are ego involved. Um, I started asking around, but nobody seemed to know. And I finally went to our Dean of Women and I said, you know, I'd like to find her because I'd really like to find out where did I miss her? What did I do? What, 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 you know, what could I have done so that I can improve, so that I can become a better teacher? And uh, she kind of paled and she said, oh, uh, Leo, haven't you heard? This young lady uh, drove her car to Pacific Palisades, which is a place, if you know Los Angeles, where sheer cliffs drop into the sea. And people who were picnicking on the grass saw this beautiful girl step out of her car, leaving her motor running. She walked zombie-like across the grass and threw herself off the cliff onto the rocks below. And you know, I, I, I purposely tell this story every place I go because the question I ask myself as I ask myself then is what did it matter that we had taught this girl to read and to write and to spell if somewhere along the line we had lost her, if we hadn't taught her the things that were essential. And for this reason I stuck my neck out and I started a love class. And I thought that maybe somehow people who needed could come and tell us that they need. And it isn't psychotherapy. I'm an educator. I'm not a psychotherapist. And I believe that wherever you are in love and however you've learned love, if you want to learn it differently, anything that is learned can be unlearned and can be relearned. And so there's always hope and there's always wonder. And you don't have to sit and cry about the fact that somebody mistreated you or that you learned love incorrectly or that you're dying of loneliness. If you get up and grab your own paintbrush, you can paint a new set. You can surround yourself with new actors and you can get on the stage and create your own scene. And that's my hope. And so that's particularly what I'd like to talk to you about um, tonight. But essentially, uh, my, my, I labeled my talk instead of love broadly. Uh, I'd like to talk with you a little bit about what I consider to be uh, essential. And then we'll get around to this. And that's why I called my talk, What is Essential is Invisible to the Eye. What was essential about this young lady was not that she was attractive, was not that she was intelligent. What was essential in her, it was impossible for me to see because I was looking at what was not essential and judging in terms of what was not essential. And you know, some of you recognize that title. It's not uh, original with me. What is essential is invisible to the eye. It's from a beautiful little book called The Little Prince. And if you haven't read it, it was worth your getting out tonight and leaving your favorite television show to come and just to, to get this as a reference. It's Exupéry Saint Exupéry's wonderful book. He was a little Frenchman who had beautiful, wondrous things to say. And he wrote this book, which contains almost everything there is that will come into contact in our way of life. And he tells the, the wonderful story about a little boy, a little prince, who lived on a planet. And his planet had only a number. And it was a wondrous little planet. He was, it was very tiny. 
In fact, by moving his chair just a few inches, he could see 44 sunsets, you know, every single day. And his planet didn't have people on it. He was all alone. And one day, a seed blew in and landed on his planet. And he nurtured it, and he loved it, and he cared for it. And this wonderful seed grew into a beautiful, wondrous rose. And like many, many beautiful, wondrous things, it was very vain. And he had never experienced vanity. He didn't know what it was, and the rose was always making demands. Cover me, your planet is drafty. You know, take care of me, why aren't you watering me? Pluck that little dead spot off. And she was always bragging and saying that she didn't, tigers didn't bother her because she had thorns to fight off the tiger. And he didn't understand this little rose. And so one day he decided that he couldn't bear it anymore. He went down to earth to try to find out how to deal with roses. And he meets all kinds of wondrous people. But finally, about halfway through the book, he meets a little fox. And that's the part I want to share with you. And that's the part from which I get the title of this. And uh, the fox comes up to him one day and says, tame me. And he says, I don't know what it means to tame. He says, oh, well, every day I'll come out and stick my nose out of my little hole and you come a little closer to me. And one day you'll say good morning and then the next day you'll come a little closer and then you'll come a little closer and then pretty soon we'll be friends. And uh, this little prince says, well, what does it mean, you know, being friends? Well, we'll have something special, you and me, something unique in all the world if you tame me. And he says, well, I can't stay long, you know, I'll have to leave. And the fox says, that's all right. He says, but uh, when you do leave, I'll cry. The little prince says, well, how come you're going to cry and you want to be tamed? Why do you want to be hurt? And he says, because of the color of the wheat fields. And the prince doesn't understand. And he says, you know, the wheat fields mean nothing to me. They're just golden fields that go on forever. But because of the color of your hair, which is the color of the wheat fields, when you go away, the wheat fields will have meaning. And therefore, I will have become richer and therefore it will be worth my tears. And so he does tame the little fox and they have a wonderful relationship and finally the day comes when he has to leave. And this is what he says. So the little prince tamed the fox and when the hour of his departure grew near, ah, said the fox, I shall cry. Well, it's your own fault, said the little prince. I never wished you any sort of harm, but you wanted me to tame you Yes, that is so, said the fox. And now you're going to cry, said the little prince. Yes, that is so, said the fox. Then it has done you no good at all. Oh, yes, it has done me good, said the fox, because of the color of the wheat fields. And then he added, go and look again at all the roses. By the way, the little fox had found roses all over the world, and he realized that this vain rose had tricked him. She wasn't the only rose in the world. She had told him she was. Go and look again at the roses and you will understand now that yours is unique in all the world. And then come back and say goodbye to me and I will make you the present of a secret. And the little prince went away and looked deeply at the roses. Ah, he said, you're not at all like my rose. As yet you are nothing and no one has tamed you and you have tamed no one. You are like my fox when I first knew him. He was only a fox like a hundred thousand other foxes, but I have made him my friend, and now he is unique in all the world. And the roses were very much embarrassed. You were beautiful, but you are empty, he went on. No one could die for you. To be sure, an ordinary passerby would think that you look just like my rose, the rose that belongs to me. But in herself, she alone is more important than all the other hundreds of roses in the world because it is she that I have put under the glass, because it is she that I have sheltered behind the screen, because it is for her that I've killed the caterpillars, except for the two or three that we saved to become butterflies, and because it is she that I've listened to when she grumbled or she boasted, and even sometimes when she said nothing, because you see, she is my rose. And he went back to meet the fox. Goodbye, he said. Goodbye, said the fox. And now here is my secret, a very simple secret, which now you know. It is only with the heart that one sees rightly what is essential is invisible to the eye. 
Now, if I had any sense, I'd just sit down and say good night. <laughs> I can't and won't top that. But I would like to talk a little bit to you about what we consider to be important. But before I do that, I'd like to take my coat off. That's only the beginning. Um, I had a very interesting experience. I fly around the country an awful lot. And um, when I do, I bring mounds and mounds and mounds of work because it's the only really peaceful time I have. You see, my rule is always people first and things second. So when I'm in my office, uh, there is no peace. And when I'm at home, there's a telephone ringing and there are people around. And it's what I ask for and what I want and what I love. But when I'm on an airplane, it's like having your own private office. You disappear in the clouds. Nobody knows who you are. And so you say, could I have the seat next to me? I have a lot of work to do. And they say, well, if the plane isn't full, we will indeed give you the seat next to you. And most of the time you have it. Then I spread out all of my things and I work and I think. And when I'm finished, I look out at the clouds and I think of the wonder of the magic of the, of, of the universe. Uh, and on this particular day, there was an empty chair between me and a very attractive middle-aged lady who was sitting over here, all bejeweled and beautifully attired. And I sat down and I laid out all my things and she watched me, you know, very, very interested. And I saw that I could feel by her vibrations that she wanted to talk. And I thought, oh my God, you know. <laughs> I love her, but I have an exam to prepare, and I have papers to read, and, and uh, so I said, so she said, uh, I'll bet I can guess where you are, and I said, uh, what am I, and she said, well, I'll bet you're a lawyer, and I said, no, I'm not a lawyer, well, then you're a teacher, I said, that's what I am, I'm a teacher, she said, oh, how nice, and then I went back to my, to my work, and, um, and then she started to talk, and all of a sudden I realized, oh, there you go, you know, you're always talking about people first. If you really mean it, this lady needs you. She obviously wants to talk. Talk to her for a while, and then maybe you can explain your, your need to get to work, and then we can, you know, well, it didn't work that way, but, but it was magical, because all of a sudden, like an avalanche, she began to tell me all kinds of things. Sometimes you'll tell a stranger what you won't tell the closest person in your life because she knew that when we arrived in Los Angeles we would just split and there was no danger of uh, perhaps of ever seeing her again and so she started to tell me that she had four children and that she had just come from the Bahamas and uh, she I said oh did you have a good time she said no it was terrible and I said were, were, were you alone and she said yes and I said uh, oh and I thought that was rather interesting, but I wasn't going to pursue it. And so she allowed, she immediately told me, she said, uh, uh, I was on a holiday by myself. I'm trying to get my, myself together. And I said, oh, really? Yes, she said, um, two months ago, my husband left me. And I said, oh, I'm sorry. And then she started and she told me the story of her life. Imagine I gave him, she said, the best, really, the best years of my life. I didn't think people said that anymore. <laughs> I gave him the best years of my life. I gave him beautiful children. I gave him a magnificent house and I always kept it clean. There was no dust anywhere, I was sure of that. My children were always on time to school and always, in the, she went on and on telling me all about, I'm a magnificent cook, I entertained his friends, I was always ready to go every place he wanted to, I would, and she went on and on and on, you know, and I really felt sorry for this lady because all of the things that she had considered essential were things that he could have bought. You want a housekeeper, buy her. She had lost herself. She had not given him what is essential about her. The magic, the wonder, the undiscovered self. She'd given him good food. He could have gone to a restaurant. She cleaned his sheets. He could have gone to a laundromat.
that frightened me. I asked her, you know, what did you do for you? She says, what do you mean, what do you mean for me? I mean, what did you do for yourself? Well, there wasn't any time to do anything for myself. What would you like to have done? Oh, I've always had a dream of throwing pots. You know? <laughs> How wonderful if, if she would have thrown some pots. She didn't know it was essential. And I felt sorry for her because what she did was what she believed was essential. This is what the culture had told her was essential. She was fulfilling a role, and she had lost herself in her role. And then, you know, husband meets interesting young lady in office who isn't interested in dust. We talked a long time that day about what is essential. She cried a little bit, I cried a little bit. We hugged each other and she indeed went her way and I went mine. But you know, she had never bothered to ask herself, what is essential about me? What is my worth? And if you don't know this yet as a lover, think about it a little. If you are truly a lover, you want to give the best you there is. And that means developing all the wonder of you as a unique human being. And you know, indeed, even though you have been taught differently, everybody in this place is unique. That's the wonder of it. There are no two of you alike. Every one of you is different. How marvelous if somehow we had taught this woman to find her uniqueness early, to teach her how to develop it, and teach her the wonder of sharing it with everybody else. Because there is no limit to you, you will always be exciting. You will always have something to share with this man. But she didn't bother to look for what is essential. And she took on the role of what people told her was essential. And she lost herself. But you know, the wonderful thing about it is that you never really lose yourself, only temporarily. If you want to find yourself, you're still there. You don't lose anything you ever had. And if sometimes you feel a vast emptiness in you, a gnawing in your gut, something screaming to come out, it's that X factor, it's that wonderful uniqueness in you that says, I'm still there, I'm still there. Paint me, throw me, cook me, produce me, share me. And then you'll know a little bit about what is essential. But you know, we're certain that what is essential must be out there. It can't be in here. I don't know how many of you are acquainted with the little Sufi books, but they're magnificent little books that uh, have come out of, of uh, uh, a religious, the Sufi religious sect. And they're, they're fabulous little parables, little stories, and they're delightful to read. And they're in little paperbacks, and you can get it. S-U-F-I, Sufi. And, and what it is is they're, they're little adventures that happen to a crazy little man whom they call the mullah, M-U-L-L-A. And uh, there's one in it that's very pointed in this respect, is one day the mullah was out on the street, and he was on his hands and knees, and he was looking for something. And a friend of his came up and said, mullah, what are you looking for? And the mullah said, I lost my key, my house key. And the man said, oh, mullah, that's terrible. I'll help you find it. And he got down on his hands and knees and he was patting. And he said, mullah, where did you lose it? He said, I lost it in my house. And he said, then what are you looking here for? He said, there's more light here. <laughs> you know, that's hilarious, but that's what we do with our lives. 
We believe that everything there is to find is out there where it's easy to find it when the only answers for you are in you. Go ahead and look and look and look. You're not going to find them out there. Nobody has your answers, only you have your answers. And if you think that you can pack up your bag and escape you, you're in for a mighty big surprise. Run to a mountaintop in Nepal, and after you get over the idea that you are in Nepal and all the wonder of Nepal, who are you faced with one day in the mirror? You, with all your hang-ups, with all your fears, with all your confusion, with all your loneliness, with all the things that are you. And so it's time that we begin to look at what is essential, and what is essential is not out there. What is essential is indeed in here. But it's not easy to search in the dark. And nobody teaches us what is essential. How many classes did you ever have in your entire educational career that taught you what was essential? They taught you mathematics, and I'm not saying that's not essential, but you can live without it. Did you know that? It's nice to have. You know, it's nice to be able to read. But you can also live very joyously without being able to read. Though it's magnificent and I'm not encouraging you not to learn to read. Even though some of you know how to read and they spent years and years of your educational career teaching you how to read and you never read. The latest statistics say, you know, that the average university graduate, and this is going to shock you, reads probably one book a year after graduation, and that's usually The Godfather. <laughs> you know, and there's nothing wrong with The Godfather. It was a rip-roaring tale. But is that the only thing there is to read? But there are no classes in life. There are no classes in love. There are no classes in I am lonely, what can I do, 1A? I am confused. <laughs> And when you try to teach these classes, you are truly, and I swear to you, treated like you are some sort of a fool. You know, I've been labeled by the media the love doctor. Good grief. <laughs> and supposedly, one of the greatest honors came to me when I received the letter asking me to appear on What's My Line? I mean it, I swear. What's my line? <laughs> Almost in every holy book that I have ever read, and I spent, oh, you must do this sometime. Give it to yourself as a present. Sometime go in and collect up all the holy books and sit down and read them for commonalities. How marvelous, and there are so many commonalities. But you know, Jesus said, if you want to find yourself, you've got to look inside. In fact, if you want to find me, he said, you have to look inside. Buddha said it. The Hebraic holy books say it. The Quran, the Gita, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, the Tao, all of them say this. Trips outside of you are worthless. They are going to lead you into the forest and you're going to be lost. If you want answers for you, the answers for you are inside, not outside of you. But what do we think is essential? Well, first of all, one of the things we think is very indeed essential, and most of us work all of our lives for it, is this body. We think this is essential. We spend so much time with this that we keep Madison Avenue rich. My God, the, the thousands of varieties of toothpastes. <laughs> and if you use close-up, kid, you're in. <laughs> the millions of different kinds of hair. You know, it was enough that you used to... I remember when I was a kid, we used to wash with plain old ordinary ivory soap. And now there is something for soft hair, for thick hair, for thin hair, for, for falling hair, for rising hair. 
There is, a, there is a hair tonic for children and for babies and for adults and for senior citizens. We can't even share each other's hair tonics. You know, it's, it's really a distancing phenomenon when you think about it. The days of asking to use your toothpaste, huh? But you know, when you really think about it, it's very ludicrous how much time we spend here. If we spent only one sixteenth of the time with this on our voyage within, instead of the time we spend here deodorizing. And every day someone's coming up with something new that we've got to have if we want to make it. Pretty soon it's going to take you nine hours to get out of the john in the morning. Don't you, don't you sometimes get really kind of tired of all this nonsense like, you know, you start by doing this and this and this and this and this and then you put your clothes on and then you go out into the day and you spend your eight hours and you come back and then you do everything in reverse. You take it all off and then you go to bed and then in the morning you put it all on again. But we do it because we're afraid that our, the people are going to leave us on the dock you know, if we don't use the certain kind of deodorant. And the boat will come back for us if we use it. So we use it. But you know, what this is, is a magnificent vehicle. It carries what is essential, but it itself is not essential. Oh, one of my great heroes, those of you who know me, know that I have several great heroes. And one of my great heroes is little old Bucky Fuller. And I just love this man. And every year he comes to see us at the university. And every year he gets more beautiful. And every year he gets more ma magical. And you know, he's something like 78 years young. And he has now great thick lenses and he has hearing aids behind both ears and he carries a, a cane and he walks up on the stage but the minute he gets before an audience magic he takes no audiovisual aids for him he takes a piece of chalk and a chalkboard and he begins to talk and beautiful things come out magical things come out and he wrote an article just recently he is asking the question what is essential He's still asking it at 78 years old. And he wrote an article that maybe some of you read in the Saturday Review World just recently. And he says this, and I have to quote it because it's delightful. He says, I am 78, and at my age, I find that I have now taken in more than 1,000 tons of water, food, and air, the chemistry of which is temporarily employed for different lengths of time as my hair, my skin, my flesh, my bones, my blood, etc. And then progressively it's discarded. I weighed in in the world at seven pounds, and I went on to 70, and then 170, and even 207 pounds. And then I lost 70 pounds, and I said, who is that 70 pounds? <laughs> because I'm still here. The 70 pounds I got rid of was 10 times the flesh and bone inventory with which I weighed in in 1895. I am certain that I'm more, I'm more than the fat of my most recent meals, and some of which will become my hair only to be cut off twice a month. I lost 70 pounds of organic chemistry, which obviously wasn't me, nor any of the remaining presently associated atoms, me. We have been making a great error in identifying me and you as these truly transient and ergo sensorily detectable chemistries. There have been quite a number of weighing ins of people as they died. Many cancer doomed paupers have been willing to have their beds placed on scales. The only difference manifest between weight before and after death is that caused by air exhaled from the lungs or urine that has been passed. Whatever life is, it doesn't weigh anything. Life is metaphysical weightless and limitless. Each life is an eternally individual, unique pattern of integrity. You, each of you, is an individual, unique pattern of integrity that will never pass this way again. 
but it has nothing to do with the shape and size of your body. It has nothing to do with the color of your eyes. And yet we spend so much of our lives pampering this. I had a yoga teacher once who said, take care of it. It's a magnificent, wondrous vehicle. But it only is a vehicle that carries what is essential. It is not in itself essential. So what is essential? Well, we think our learning is essential. And we become addicted to our learning. And we learn and we learn and we learn and we spend our lives filling our minds with what we consider to be essential and what I call mostly static. And we become addicted to this static. And that's sad because then anything that tries to get in that's new has to be screened through this static, through this old learning. And that's why it's so hard for some of us to change. You know, I often ask people, are you truly the you of you? Or are you the you that other people have told you you are? Because, you know, people do spend their entire lives telling us who we are. And it's done in some of the most unconscious ways. The mama, for instance, who's standing in the market shopping and she has her basket there and little junior in one hand and she's talking to mrs w who is standing there with her basket and sally in her hand and she says to mrs w this one's the dumb one you know the other one really is the smart one but you know you have to have some dumb ones and after all he's kind of nice he doesn't give me any trouble what's she telling this kid does she think he's deaf Everybody teaches everybody all of the time what they are and who they are. That's why everybody is a teacher. And as a lover, you had better be very, very cautious indeed about the labels you put on to others. But you know, I don't care where you are in your learning. You are nowhere we're very impressed with labels and we believe that because somebody has a PhD they must be very wise indeed I have news for you some of the most stupid people I know have PhDs some of the wisest people I know don't even know what a PhD is I don't know if I ever told any of you this story, but I want to share it with you because it, it shows so much what I'm trying to talk about. I, I was listening to learn it. I was picked as, as a brain pool. Did you know they're picking brains now? And they bring you together brains and you sit around and you talk about what's this, what's the, what are things going to really be like in about 120 years, you know. You're the brain, so you better, you know. This kind of thing. I, I was brought to St. Louis with a lot of other brains. And all of us prepared brainy papers. And all of us had PhDs. And I listened for one whole 24 hour period to brainy papers. And finally I had had brainy papers right up to here. <laughs> and so I disappeared. And I walked down by the river. I like rivers. And I walked along the river and I saw a little old man sitting there and he was munching on a piece of cheese and he had no teeth and he was, you know, bad, we would have called him badly dressed and ill-kept. His hair, had, he hadn't seen Brecht for a long time. <laughs> Never heard of deodorant. But he had two eyes, the likes of which I have talked about, eyeballs. I walked along and caught them and they did a ballet step in his, you know, right pow. And I looked at him and I, I, I said, good morning. And he said, good morning, sit down. Like that. And uh, so I sat down and I joined him. And he was offering me a piece of his cheese. And he had a bottle of wine. And we sort of sipped wine and cheese. And he told me a lot of wondrous things. Talk about wisdom. And he said one thing that I shall never forget which was the most brilliant thing I heard in those four days of PhD papers. 
He said, you know, the trouble with our country, boy. He called me boy. <laughs> that was really neat, you know. <laughs> he kept on this, this kind of thing. And then he said, I said, you know, you seem so wise. Do you have any secret of life? Oh, indeed, I have a secret of life. I said, what is it? And he said, if you really want to live happily, you always keep your brains full and your bowels empty. <laughs> now there is wisdom. And the trouble with our country is that the opposite is always true. <laughs> Remember that your learning can hamper you if you believe that what you know is wisdom and therefore you are screening out all things that are coming in through that wisdom you will never grow you will never change I know people that are still teaching classes they have taught 20 years ago in exactly the same way I have seen third and fourth grade teachers that have taught fourth grade classes for nine years and they have teach the westward movement. That's very important. That's very essential. And every time it's time to teach the westward movement, they go to their file and they open the door and they pull out this old decaying thing. And you know she's taught it for nine years because there are nine pinholes in the pictures. And she puts them on her bulletin board and she says to the kids, with great enthusiasm, we're going to talk about the westward movement. <laughs>